Hey, well, good morning. I want to thank you for uh, once again joining me as we um, take a look at God's Word together. And hopefully you had a great Resurrection Sunday. We had a wonderful time around here and hoping that God just continues to build on what he did last Sunday. Just a reminder that um, on Sunday mornings we have a, a 9 o'clock indoor service and a 1045 outdoor service. The 9 o'clock service has some of the different um, COVID-related restrictions in place. Uh, and I think we're all familiar with what those look like, but we'd love for you to come. Um, it's exciting to see people increasingly feeling um, a little more comfortable um, gathering together, whether it's indoors or outdoors. Um, it's just neat to see the body functioning as a body together, so that's been great. Um, also, 1045, we're outside, and um, we'd love for you to join us for that as well, out there on the lawn, and we'll continue to do that as long as it seems to make sense. And the weather cooperates. And as always, we'll continue to provide uh, the message online for you as well. Uh, so we're back to our series in the book of James. We have just, we're in the last chapter and just a little bit left. And the passage we're looking at today comes from James chapter 5, beginning in verse 13 and reading through verse 18. James writes these words. He says, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. I think it's pretty easy to figure out what the main focal point of this passage is about. It's about prayer. In fact, prayer or pray, um, the word shows up seven times in this passage. Max Lucado said the highest calling of Christians is the ministry of prayer. Francis Chan said, if prayer isn't vital to your church, then your church isn't vital. I think they're both right. Prayer is just that important. In fact, in verse 16, James says, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And so we know all these things. We know that what the highest calling of a Christian is, is the ministry of prayer. We know that um, if our church isn't praying, that we're not really fulfilling God's call for the church. We know that that um, prayer has the potential to be powerful and effective. We know all this, yet still the reality is that many of us struggle to arrange our daily lives in such a way that prayer is really a priority. And when it comes to the call for communal prayer, for people to come and gather together to pray together, it's amazing how often we struggle that, with that in the church. We read passages about prayer, we talk about prayer, but when it comes to actually praying, all of a sudden we, we struggle. Maybe it's out of, out of fear of not knowing what to say or how to pray, or it's talking to a God that we can't hear audibly. I don't know all the reasons for it, but we just seem time, sometimes seem to struggle in the area of prayer. And, um, but Jesus said that apart from me, you can do nothing. So we'd be wise to really make prayer a greater priority in our lives. And um, so I think this is a really relevant passage that we're looking at this morning in and in this passage, James talks about sport, four specific times or occasions that it's a good idea to pray. And the first thing he says, is, it's good to pray when we're troubled. It's good to pray when we are troubled. Verse 13, he says, is anyone among you in trouble? Well, let them pray. And the word trouble actually in Greek means to suffer from hardship. And Jesus is pretty clear that in this world... He said, we will have trouble. We will have hardships. But Jesus is also really clear that even though in this world you will have troubles, he also said, I will not leave you, I will not forsake you. I'm with you always. And, and he said, I'm going to leave my spirit. I'm not going to leave you as orphans, but I will leave my spirit. So even though we encounter troubles and trials and hardships, we don't go through those things alone. We have the ministry of prayer. And I like what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. He said, cast all your anxiety on him. Because he cares for you. And either because we know that God loves us, because we know that he cares for us, we cast all our anxiety. And you've heard me share before that 
we don't just cast our problems on God, we cast our anxiety on God. You know, not just our problems with finances, but our worries about finances. Not just our, our, our problems in relationships, but our tendency to worry about those things. Um, I, I love that idea that we not ju- God doesn't just care about the issues. He cares also about how we're processing those issues. So today I, don't, I would just say, what is troubling you? What is weighing most heavy on your heart? What is of greatest concern to you? James says, if there's anything like that, then we should pray. Which I think for a lot of us, you know, that comes naturally, is when we are having a lot of troubles and trials, it's most natural to pray because we need help. But the second one that he goes on a little bit further is kind of the opposite, opposite of that. He also said that it's, it's good to pray when we're happy. We should also pray when things are going well. In verse 13, he says, is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Now, it may seem obvious that we should pray and praise God when we're happy and when things are going well, but the truth is that often when things are going well, we don't feel the same level of, of, of motivation sometimes to pray because we don't feel like we have to. Things are already going well, and sometimes God kind of gets forgotten. And, and prayer is kind of you know, not as big a priority as when we're in trouble. Um, for some people, the only time they do pray is when they're in trouble, and once the crisis subsides, then they kind of go back to life as it was before. You know, but when we're happy, when things are going well, we should praise God. We don't want to be like the ten lepers that came before Jesus and he, he healed them and they went back and, and only one of them came back to ever say thank you. The other nine were enjoying the blessing of being healed, but only one took the time to actually come back. You know, it, it says, um, actually the word praise is found at least 550 times in the Bible. And praise doesn't always have to be in the form of singing, although James mentions that we should sing songs of praise, and there's a lot in the Bible about singing. I know that's not everybody's strong suit or passion or anything like that. I happen to like music a lot, so it comes naturally, but I know that everybody's not always there. But whether it's in the form of a song or a prayer, we need to take time and give credit where credit is due and praise God for who he is and everything that he's doing. You know, and the point is that we don't just enjoy the blessings of God without ever taking time to bless God, to praise God, to thank him for all that he's d- done. So has God done anything good in your life? Is there anything at all good in your life? If you can't think of anything, then, boy, you really need prayer. Um, but if, if there's anything good, then, then maybe even this morning as we go through this, just po- hit the pause button and just take a moment right now and, and praise God. Thank God for something. Just hit the pause button and come back to it. But take a moment just to give God thanks. The third occasion that James mentions, he says it's good to pray when you're not feeling well. When you're not feeling well, when you're sick, when your body's not feeling well. Verse 14 to 15, he says, Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. Now there's A lot to kind of process in this passage, so I'm going to spend a little bit longer in this area than I did in the last couple. Not because it's more important, but just there's kind of more stuff here. So he says, is anyone among you sick? And the word sick in Greek actually means to feel weak. That's what sickness does to us. It makes us feel weaker. Um, Both physically and emotionally, we just, we feel spent. And maybe you've been there before, you're there right now. So when we're feeling sick or weak or we're just hurting physically, he says, we should pray. We should call upon the Lord. And and the reality is, for most of us, that's a really natural time to pray, is when sickness and and disease and injury come to our lives. Man, I I can't tell how many times I've been sick or something, and and my prayer isn't very theological. It's just, oh, God, help me. You know, and just, oh, make it go away. Make it stop. You know, fix it, God. And, you know, if you've been there, it's just, you're just, you're praying nonstop. But we should be people who call upon the Lord to help us. You know, and, um, but James also says that when we're sick, that there are times that we should also call the elders of the church to come and pray for us as well. And um, I, th- I think that's significant. A lot of times we, we call and we pray upon God and, you know, and call upon God, and, but we don't always call others to pray for us as well. And, um, I, and so I'm not saying that every time you've got a headache that you should 
call the elders and ask them to come over and have prayer for you, but, but maybe that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. You know, and, um, and, and we should, when we're sick, we should call upon the elders of the church to pray over us, anoint us with oil, and, and we do that sometimes in the church, but we certainly could do a lot better with that. And so when James talks about calling the elders, by the way, he's not talking about the elderly. Um, in Scripture, in the New Testament, the word elder is used 76 times. But only nine of the time, those, of those 76 is it talking about the elderly. Most of the time, in the case right here with James, when he's talking about the elder, he's talking about leaders or overseers in the church. And, and people are in a specific role or, or seen as, as leaders and within the church. So the question is, well, why call specifically the elders to pray for you? Why not just anybody? Well, you probably could call anybody, but why specifically the elders? What's so special about their prayers? And let me be really clear. The power of our prayers, the power for our prayers to be answered isn't dependent upon the ones who are praying. It's dependent upon the one who's answering. Um, So um, it's not really about the specific person. It's really about God. We need to be really, really clear about that. You know, that being said, verse 16 does say the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So when you're praying, you know, is, you can ask anybody, but specifically, think about those who's, who are righteous. And if you read the letters to the churches in the Bible, in the Bible we know that there, were, there was a really high standard for those who were considered to be elders. You know, they needed to be righteous people to even be in that position. You know, it wasn't about popularity or anything like that. There wasn't a big church vote, you know. It's it really based on, on just their, their, they were already very righteous people. And so James says that we would be wise to turn people that are righteous. And, and not because they have a position. In fact, there's a lot of people that are righteous, don't have the position. But just find people that are good and godly people and, and, and ask them to pray for you. And I think we all know people that for whatever reason, they just, you know, and probably because they are righteous, they have a right relationship with God and they live a life that honors God, they seem to have this really, really deep connection with God. And it seems like when they pray, you just have this confidence that God's probably listening to them. You know, growing up, I remember listening to certain people in the church. I still know people like that. And it's like, anytime that comes up, I wanted those people to be the ones to pray for me because it felt like they had the inside track with God. And so we should call people like that to pray for us. Are, who are those people in your life? I, I would ask you that. Who are those people that are saying, if I've got something in my life, I know that this person is just right with God, and I would call upon, the, call upon them to pray for me. You know, um, I also think that there's something God-honoring and faith-building actually about calling upon others to pray for us. Throughout Scripture, God calls us to pray with each other and for each other. Jesus in Matthew chapter 18, verse 19 to 20, he said, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I with them. God's heart, Jesus is saying that God's heart goes out to, to people when the Christians come together and we pray in the name of the Lord, that God's presence is right there. And that's, that's pleasing to God. He wants to pour out his blessing when, the, when people come together. And I think it's, it's sad how much we struggle in the church getting people to come out and pray together. You know, some of the most poorly attended things that, that churches do are, are centered around prayer for whatever reason. And yet we say it's supposed to be super important. You know, and, and so we, we've got so many opportunities for that. We've got prayer pockets. That should be a priority in our life. We, Wednesday night we're doing an encounter where we spend time reading a psalm together and worship, and we spend time praying together at the end. We need to be doing that. We need to be calling upon people to pray for us. Well, anyways, and before I move on to the next thing, I just want to ask you about that. What is your level of commitment to communal prayer? You know, to you know, to, to not just asking people to pray for you, but praying for others as well as interceding and coming together. You know, if there's one thing I'd love to see us grow in as a church, it's to be more committed in praying together. So I encourage you to consider when there are opportunities for us to pray together, um, that that's a priority in your life as well. 
Well, anyways, in this passage, uh, James also mentions about call the elders and have them anoint you with oil uh, for prayer. What's that about? Well, I think we know that's not like pins oil, oil kind of thing. You know, it's a specific oil that they had. You know, it's made with myrrh and cinnamon and other ingredients and a variety of different things. And anointing oil is mentioned at least 20 times in Scripture. But, but what we have to understand is that there's not any supernatural healing power in the oil itself. Just as, um, you know, the, the power of healing isn't in the, the prayer of the elders, but the one we pray to, the oil doesn't have any kind of supernatural power where it's magical and if you touch people with it that they're healed. That's not what it's about. In Scripture, the anointing oil represented the presence and the power of the Lord. It was a, a symbol, a representation of the power and the presence of the Lord. And so when an elder or when somebody would take the oil and they would, you know, touch somebody's head or, or somewhere and anoint them with oil, it was really a way of saying that if there's going to be any healing that takes place here today, it's only because God has poured out his presence and his power upon, upon you. You know, just it's a reminder of God's holy presence in, in this process of healing. That's the significance of the oil, and so we, we need to do that as well. Um, going Another part of this, in verse 14, it also says that when we pray, we should pray in the name of the Lord. Now, it doesn't mean that, that praying in the name of the Lord is like some secret password or, you know, or this magic word like abracadabra, and then God's obligated to do whatever we ask for because we said, in the name of Jesus. You know, it's, that's not what it's about. You know, the, praying in the name of the Lord has two different parts to it. You know, first of all, when we pray in the name of the Lord, we're recognizing the one that we're praying to. We're recognizing that, that God is supreme and, and that God is the healer. It's not, nobody else is capable of bringing about healing. Let me say this as well. Not, not only nobody else is capable of bringing about healing, but nothing else is capable of bringing about healing. You know, I've dealt with people every once in a while that are really into crystals and things like that, you know, and, and popular in the New Age movement, and different crystals do different rocks, do different things, and have different powers. And, and James says, we don't pray in the power of, of, of a rock or a crystal or some other religious leader or any other gods, and they, boy, they had a lot of gods in those days. We pray in the name of the Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's not like it's some secret magic word, but we're saying, you know, this is the one that we're committed to. Not all these other things. We don't turn to any other source to be our source of, of power. You know, it's only in the name of the Lord. So that's part of it. We pray in the name of the Lord. But also praying the Lord has another part about, about it. Is that we're saying, we're also praying in accordance with God's will. You know, um, even though we have our own thoughts when we pray about what we got, would like God to do, and that's okay. You know, a lot of times in my prayers I say, God, I'll be honest with you. This is what I would love to see you do. You already know that that's my heart's desire. This is, you know, plan A. I would love this. But when we pray in the name of the Lord, we're saying, God, this is what I would like to see happen. But even so, like Jesus said, not my will but yours be done. Like Jesus in the garden where he said, God, if there's any other way, take this cup of suffering from me. But even so, not my will, but yours be done. And, and so that's huge. We, we pray and we're honest about what we'd like to see happen. But when we pray in the name of the Lord, it means we also submit to the will of the Lord. And, and so prayer is less about getting you know, God to do our will and much more about being willing to do God's will. That's the heart of what he's talking about there. James there is a tricky part of this passage, though. James says that the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. And so the question is, why aren't people healed every time we pray for them? You know, and, and so it's tempting. Well, we say, well, it says the, you know, the, the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. And so we may feel like, well, if I prayed and they, they didn't get healed, then I must not have had enough faith. So it's, it's on me because it couldn't be God. You know, and so, and so it is troubling a lot of times is when we pray and have faith and, and nothing happens, we either blame God that he didn't fulfill his promise or we blame ourselves because, you know, if we'd had more faith, then maybe this healing would have taken place. You know, and, and so, you know, what is the issue? And the honest answer is we don't know why God heals sometimes and why he doesn't other times. 
we know it's that way, if we're really realistic, is that not every time we pray do we experience the healing that we like. Now, Scripture does indicate that sometimes faith is an issue. Sometimes faith is an issue. You know, we're going through the motions, we're saying things, but we're not really believing that God is going to, to answer. And to be honest, sometimes we, we believe that God can, but we don't always believe that he will. You know, so sometimes faith is an issue. Sometimes faithfulness is an issue. And by that, you know, it's back to are we being obedient to God in our lives? And if we're not faithful, you know, in terms of being obedient to God, then regardless of what we believe about God, if we're not faithful, you know, why would we believe that God would honor our prayers? You know, the prayers of a righteous man accomplishes much. Not somebody who's living in sin and unfaithful and then just calling upon the Lord to, you know, to, to grant their three wishes. But the reality is to, that to presume that our lack of faith is to blame for every unanswered prayer, it's um, unreasonable and it's probably even unbiblical as well. You know, we don't know the answers for why God heals and doesn't other times. Um, you know, the truth is actually that all healing is temporary at best. You know, think about this, you know, that even Lazarus was raised from the dead, but at some point he died. And all those other people that Jesus healed, the blind and, you know, the lame and, and those who couldn't walk and talk and all these other things, you know, they all at some point died. You know, we live in a world that at some point disease will take over our body. There's no way to get around that. You know, and so, so we need to kind of understand that. But what we do know is that while God always has the power to heal, it's not always his plan to heal. That's where praying the name of the Lord comes back. You know, because he may have the power. I always believe that God can, but I'm not always sure that he will because he doesn't always heal the way we like. You know, and, um, but we pray in the name of the Lord. God, this is what I like to see happen, but even so, not my will, but yours be done. And even if we can't guarantee results, we would still be wise that if we're hurting or we're needing physical healing and, or sick, that we call upon the name of the Lord to heal us. Well, let's go on the fourth area that he mentions here. It's also good to pray when we're struggling with sin. Sometimes we don't want to pray when we're struggling with sin. We just want to sin and deal with God later. But in verse 16, it says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now, James is not saying that the reason someone is sick is because they've sinned. Actually, in Jesus' day, there were many who believed that very thing, that if if somebody was sick, well, then they must have sinned. They must have done something wrong. You know, that was the mindset of Job's friends. When, when he was sick and he had all this adversity in his life, they came over and they said, Job, you must have done something. Even if you don't know it, you must have done something to warrant being sick and having all this, you know, heaped on you. And they kept trying to get him to confess to God, you know, his sins. And Job's like, I don't, I, can't, I didn't do anything wrong. If God were here, I would tell him, I, I didn't do anything wrong. You know, and um, in, in John chapter 9, Jesus' disciples came across a man who'd been blind since birth. And it was interesting. They asked Jesus, they said, who sinned and caused this man to be blind? Was it his man or was, was it this man or was it his parents? So even they had this mindset is, who sinned that this person ended up blind? It must have been either him or, or his parents, although I don't know how it would have been him if he was blind since birth. And just doesn't make sense. It's really, honestly, kind of a stupid question. Talk about making people feel horrible, just heaping guilt on them if they're sick. Well, you must have done something to deserve it. But Jesus kind of stopped in their tracks. He said, neither. This happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. You know, and, and so sometimes God's glory is displayed in us because of healing. But other times, God's glory is revealed in our sickness. You know, in, in terms of how we deal with things and how God works in our lives in spite of things. And that's, that's great. And maybe that helps us understand the previous part, too, of why God doesn't heal all the time. Is that sometimes it's not his plan because his glory can be revealed in a different way. And sometimes he can work in our lives and develop a different level of character. Or he can draw us closer to him. You know, he can strengthen our faith sometimes because of the, the illness or the sickness or, or whatever Things are going on in our lives that aren't answered prayer the way we like as well. You know, and um, so all that being said, though, James does say that when we're struggling with sin, we need to pray. And, and he even says that we should 
confess our sins to others and ask them to pray for us as well. Now, that freaks us out, quite honestly, a lot of us. We're very private people. You know, to actually tell somebody that we sin and, and to share what that sin is, is really, really unsettling to be that kind of, that, that vulnerable with other people. You know, but, um, but that's what he calls us to do. And I think there's some reasons behind that, which I'll share in just a little bit. But you may be surprised that you're not the only person struggling with sin. You know, it, I remember when I was, um, had a group of high school guys, I was youth pastor in Thousand Oaks, and, and we actually came to this very passage about confessing our sins and praying for one another. And I said, okay, guys, we can read this and talk about it and do nothing, or we can do this. So let's just take a moment. Is What, er- what areas of your life do you feel like you struggle the most with sin? And what, what are the sins that you struggle the most with? And, and they kind of, uh, you know, and so the... You know, a couple of them start off, well, you know, I really struggle with just prioritizing my time and spending my time as, you know, in God's word as much as I should and praying as much as I should, which is a safe answer if you get right down to it. You know, well, then I remember this other guy, you know, about the third person he shared. He said, I got to be honest, I've been struggling with pornography. I said, really, how so? And he said, you know, I just, on the internet and things, and I just, you know, and I, I, I can't turn away. I keep looking at him. He just, he opened up and shared. And it was interesting. Once he did, there were a couple other guys that immediately said, you know what, i got to be honest. I've been struggling in that area as well. And it what took one person to be brave and honest enough to cause the other guys to open up as well and say, you know what, you're not the only one who's dealing with that. And, and it was cool just in that time for us to actually not just pray in big general terms for each other, but to pray specifically for each other. Now, I'm not saying that you want to walk in in front, in front of a large group of people and everybody air your dirty laundry. I, I'm not, maybe that's what you need to do. I don't know. But, but at least finding one person that's good and godly and, and, and you can trust that you can just go to and say, you know, I, I just got to ask you, I've been struggling in this area a little bit, and, and I could really use your prayers. You know, and, and a lot of times we'd rather conceal our sins than confess them, but but I just want to share a few reasons why I think there's value in, in sharing our, our struggles with others. One is that I think when we go public and share with others that it's actually empowering in some ways. That, that secret sin doesn't have as much power of our lives. You know, we're bringing it into the light so that it can be dealt with. We're admitting on some level that we can't overcome this in and of ourselves. You know, and, and so there's... There's merit to that. You know, sometimes we confess our sins because our sins involve other people. You know, most sins don't impact just us. They impact others. So we need to share with others and say, you know what, I, especially in families, I know that I've been struggling with pornography. It's affecting our marriage. I've been dealing with drinking, and, and that's impacting, you know, our family life as well or whatever it might be. We need to be honest about those things because they impact others. Sometimes our, our sin and temptations can't be overcome without the support and prayers of others. You know, usually it's like we've, we've tried a lot on our own before we finally say, you know what, I, I, I got to open up and share with somebody else because trying to do it on my own isn't getting it done. You know, sometimes, you know, it's not just the, the prayers of other people. It's sometimes it's the wisdom of other people that gives us insight into how to overcome these temptations. And sometimes... Like the example I gave of the guy's growth group, it's our willingness to be honest about our own sin and, and struggles that sometimes ministers to others who may be struggling as well. It's one of the beauty of, of groups like Celebrate Recovery and, and things like that is there's this level of openness of just sharing their stories that actually ministers to others, and it's free and empowering to be able to share those things. So I ask you, are you struggling with any sin in your life today? Well, it'd be a good thing to pray about. And, and maybe even asking somebody you trust to, to pray for you is the thing that you sense it's the Spirit calling you to do. You've tried to overcome this for so long just on your own. Who can you go to and just share? I'll say, if you, if you want to come and talk to me, that's fine. But if you want to talk to somebody else, but just find somebody to share and to be in prayer with you. In this passage about prayer, it, talking about the power of prayer, James points us to the life of Elijah. And to show the power of prayer, James says this in verses 17 to 18. He says, Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. 
He prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. It's a crazy story. And um, we think we have drought issues here in California. Imagine three and a half years without that happening. Well, the, the passage here, um, the, the story he's talking about comes from 1 Kings chapter 17 through 19. And because of the wickedness of King Ahab and the Israelites, and they were worshiping Baal and given to pagan worship, um, God instructed Elijah to speak to his people and say that until he speaks again for a number of years, there would be no more rain. So after a while, all this time went by, and a few years went by, and so then there was this kind of this battle between Elijah, the prophet of God, and, and the prophets of Baal. There are 450 false prophets. And it was a battle to see whose God was the real deal. And so Elijah felt led by the Lord to call a challenge that they would both pray to their gods that their gods would send rain. So the prophets of Baal prayed that, that God would send rain and, and Elijah called upon the name of the Lord. Well, the prophets of Baal prayed like crazy and everything, you know, and danced around and even cut themselves and did all kinds of crazy stuff to try and get Baal's attention, but Baal's a false god doesn't exist, and so nothing happened. And Elijah, you know, he just called upon the name of the Lord, and, and, it, and it rained, and it just poured. You know, it came down, and, and at that time, you know, Elijah was victorious. And um, the prophets of Baal were, were killed. And here's the crazy thing. James says, we're just like Elijah. We're just like Elijah. And he says, Elijah was a man just like you and me. And that, that, that same God who answered the prayers of a man that's just like you and I and sent rain, that same God's available to you and I. You know, and, and so that's the power of prayer is it's not in the one who prays, but it's in the one that we pray to, that same power is available to us. God hasn't lost his, his power over time. He hasn't lost his, his heart for mankind either. You see, as big and powerful as he's ever been and loves us as much as he ever has and still capable of, of hearing our prayers, so we'd be wise to pray to him. You know, but what made Elijah's prayers so effective? I don't know if you ever look at people and say, man, I want my prayers to be like, like that person. Well, a couple things. One is Genesis chapter 5, verse 22. It says, Elijah walked with God. Elijah walked with God. He was faithful. Remember, the prayer of a righteous person accomplishes much. And so if we want God to hear our prayers, then our life needs to be a, a prayer as well on some level. You know, that we need to live a life that is righteous. You know, walking with God, mean, like Elijah, means that he lived in fellowship with God, which is cool. He didn't just call on God in times of crisis. He was communing with God all the time. Sometimes people only pray in times of crisis. They don't walk with God. I don't know about you, but I want to hear from my boys, not just when they need something, when they need money or need help or need something, but just calling to share what's going on. And so we need to have that kind of prayer life with God where we just, God, God would love to hear just about anything that's going on in your life. You know, so he, but also walking with God means he lived in obedience to God's will. The, you know, the other thing, um, Elijah, it says that Elijah prayed earnestly. The word earnest in the original trans translation means to consider something serious, to take something seriously. He didn't just give God lip service. He didn't just pray a quick prayer and figure he was done. He didn't just go through the motions. He really, really thought about it and meant it. He, he took prayer seriously. And, and so when you, when you pray, do you just kind of dabble in prayer, or do you take it really seriously? You know, and, and that's the kind of prayers that God honors. So just wrapping up this morning, are you, current, are you concerned or troubled by anything? Then I want to encourage you to pray. When we get done here, turn this off and just spend some time in prayer. Secondly, is there anything good in your life? then praise God about it. Are you in need of healing? Then once again, call upon the name of the Lord and maybe even consider calling others to pray for you as well. Feel free to shoot me a text or an email and I'll be happy to pray for you. We have a, we have a, a prayer ministry team and, and if you let us know, we'll, we'll, we'll send an email to others to, so they can be praying for you as well. Are you struggling with any sin in your life? 
maybe time to open up and share that with others, to confess your sin not only to God, but maybe to others as well. And just say, I'm, I'm trusting you with this. I need you to pray for me. And there's a certain level of accountability that happens with that as well. So when we get done here, my, 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 my hope and my homework assignment is, is don't just go on to something else, but take just at least five minutes right now just to talk to God. Join me in closing prayer. Lord, we just come before you right now. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the invitation to, um, to, to pray. That it's not just therapeutic, Lord. It's calling upon the Almighty God to do something that's got your fingerprints written all over it. And so, Lord God, whatever the, wherever we're at in, in life, it's a good time to pray. And so speak to us now as we speak to you. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. God bless you. Spend some time in prayer.